All right, so as I say, we have a lot of catching up to do. It's been nearly 18 months since I've seen you. Um, I'm not going to go back over everything because I will never finish if I do that, but I'm going to try to remind you of a couple of things that, um, that are coming to fruition today. So we're going to do the last act, act five of Henry the fourth part two, um, and then go on to Henry the fifth and finish it, God willing, on Thursday. Um, so I remind you that in Richard II, King Richard, the rightful king, was deposed by his cousin, his first cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, um, because he was a horrible king and destroying England, and Bolingbroke wanted to put England back into a legal framework again. Um, so he deposed him in that play, and eventually Richard was killed, um, and Henry uh, Bolingbroke became Henry IV. In the meantime, his son was appearing to be a wastrel hanging out in the slums of Eastcheap. So what we had in Richard II was that the king of right had no merit, and he was deposed by a king who had merit but questionable right, because you can't depose the rightful king without it being a problem. So we had right and merit changing places in that play. Um, in the next play, in Henry IV, part one, the main thing I want to remind you of is that Prince Hal um, gave a soliloquy in which he explained that what we're going to read tonight was going to happen. Namely, that his um, evil ways, his self-indulgence, his hanging out in the, in the inns and taverns with people like Bardolph and Pistol and Falstaff and so on, was an act was a performance to create an effect, namely to make people believe that he was no good, that he was very much like Richard had been, so that when he finally became king, he would shock and surprise everybody with his transformation, and this would uh, endear him to them, and he would have their support. So that was that great soliloquy in the beginning of Henry IV, part one. I know you all and will uphold and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Later in that play, there was a little play within the play. If you remember, Falstaff was playing uh, Prince Hal, and or Falstaff was playing the king, and Prince Hal was playing uh, himself. And then they switched roles, and Falstaff played Prince Hal, and Prince Hal played the king. And at the end, Falstaff said, after a lot of comical stuff, which I'd love to read again, but I won't because it's on tape. Um, banish plump Jack and banish all the world. That was his conclusion um, as the prince, performing the prince. And the prince, as the king, said, I will, or I do, he said, I do. And then in his own character, he said, I will. That tells us he's going to do what we're going to read about tonight. He's going to banish uh, Falstaff, and not vengefully, not nastily, but for the sake of England. Henry the Fourth, Part Two, began with the uh, character called Rumor, talking about all the confusion in England because of the uh, potential for rebellion and resistance to the king. And everybody's confused. Northumberland was confused. The low lowlifes were confused. Henry himself, the king, was confused. And everybody is longing for clarity, and there can be no clarity as long as the man who deposed the rightful king is the king, even though he's good and he's solid as a king. Um, in that play, in Henry IV, part two, um, the prince and Falstaff appear together in only two scenes. One of them we're about to read. The other was a comical one earlier on. But Falstaff is mostly playing against a very sober people, not people having fun with him like the prince making jokes and needling him, as the prince is always doing, but um, the chief justice and various lords of the court. And they, they're not entertained by Falstaff. So the tide is turning, and we're seeing that Prince Hal is, in a sense, leaving over the course of the play, 
leaving the company of Falstaff and his ilk and beginning to enter into the company of the people who are going to be his serious friends, cohorts, supporters when he becomes king. And that is, while that's happening, the king is sickening. The king has been uh, burdened by worries. He can't sleep. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown, he said. Um, and this, this pressure has resulted in illness and he's failing. So the king is failing and as the king fails and the prince, the heir to the throne, gets closer and closer to his uh, final position, um, he gets further and further away from the likes of Falstaff. Falstaff in the play earlier said, I am old, and the king said the equivalent of I am wasted. There are these two older men who have been the key stones of Prince Hal's youth are fading. All right, Act 5, Scene 1. It starts with, uh, uh, let me ask if you have questions about, that's all background, that's all repeating what, what we reached to as of a year ago, March or whatever it was. We're going to, we're going to try to go on with our lives as if this year and a half was a bad dream. But um, let me see if you have questions about the, that very quick sweep of what we've talked about before. Any? You remember this? Some of you have been reviewing your, your notes? Okay. All right. Act 5, Scene 1 of Henry IV, Part 2. Shallow says, you're not leaving tonight. You ha we want to entertain you. And we have some conversation between Shallow and Davy. Um, what's interesting there is that um, Shallow is used by Davy for his own advantage, and Davy says as much straightforwardly. Um, and the, the corruption of these local um, officers of the king uh, stand for the, the general corruption, the collapse of moral authority in the country as a whole. Davy says at line 34, I beseech you, sir, to countenance William Visor of Wancott against Clement Parks of the Hill. Shallow, there is many complaints, Davy, against that Visor. That Visor is an errant knave, on my knowledge. Why do you want me to countenance an errant knave? Davy says, I grant your worship that he is a knave, sir. But yet, do you see where I am, line 38 or so? But yet, God forbid, sir, but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request. An honest man, sir, is able to speak for himself when a knave is not. Knave means bad guy, right? As opposed to an honest man. I have served your worship truly, sir, this eight years. And if I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against an honest man, I have but very little credit with your worship. You, you can't trust me very much and you don't uh, give me much credit if you won't, on my word, forgive a bad guy as against a good guy. So Shallow says, go to, I say he shall have no wrong. Look about. And then Sir John Falstaff comes in, or he's here. And he, they go out and he has a soliloquy. And he says in the soliloquy, first of all, uh, line 56 or so, if I were sawed into quantities, Falstaff is fat, remember, I should make four dozen of such bearded hermit staves as Master Shallow. A hermit stave is a walking stick. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits and his, how they get along with each other. What? You with me? You're not with me? You find it now? It's the last long speech of Act 5, Scene 1. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> it's the last long speech of that act. Okay. And I'm about four lines down. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits and his. They, by observing him, do bear themselves like foolish justices. That's what he is, a foolish justice. 
he, uh, by conversing with them, is turned into a justice-like serving man. Their spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese. If I had a suit to Master Shallow, I would humor his men with the imputation of being near their master. If I had a suit to his men, I would curry with Master Shallow that no man could better command his servants. In other words, I'd flatter each one about his relation to the other. It is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases one of another. This is about the influence of society on the individual. What's going on around you influences you. This is why it's so important what we do in schools and what we do in the media and what we do everywhere. It, it makes a difference in um, people's character. They, they hang around weakened characters, they get weakened character. Now the irony, of course, is that Falstaff is one of the weakest characters. He's not as weak and stupid as these guys, he's very clever. But the implication of what he's saying is that Prince Hal hanging around him is not doing himself any good. Um, and Falstaff doesn't see it that way, of course. I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter, the wearing out of six fashions. Um, so I'm going to entertain him with making fun of shallow. But he's wrong. The prince is not going to let him entertain him anymore. It's over, as we'll see. All right, Act 5, Scene 2. Warwick and the Lord Chief Justice meet. How's the king? He's dead. That is Henry IV. The Chief Justice says, I would his majesty had called me with him, that is to die with him. The service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Why? What do they think? They think that the new king is going to be awful, influenced by Falstaff. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not, he says, Warwick. I know he doth not and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. I'm expecting it to be really awful, yes. Does he strike Hal or some Falstaff or something? Uh, Hal struck him, Hal struck him when he was a boy and already planning his bad behavior. And he put him in jail. We're going to hear more about the details in a minute. Um, oh, that the, Warwick says at line 15, Oh, that the living Harry had had the temper of him, the worst of these three gentlemen. How many nobles then should hold their places that must sail, that must strike sail to spirits of vile sort. We're going to have to, if only Prince Hal had the character of any of his brothers, but we're all going to have to follow what the self-indulgent, nasty, imitation rich of the second Falstaff influenced bad prince does as king. Oh God, I fear all will be overturned. So they go back and forth like this. The brothers come in and they too are worried. We don't know what's going to happen. Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, says Clarence, which swims against the stream of quality. Sweet princess, says the Chief Justice, what I did, I did in honor. And he explains that. And then the king comes in. Enter the prince as King Henry V. Chief Justice says, good morrow and God save your majesty. What's going to happen? This is the third of the three uh, dramatic triumphs that I predicted to you. So let me go back and remind you. Um, do you remember the character Feeble? Feeble was one of the people that was being drafted for the army in, with Shallow and for, for Falstaff. Falstaff had this, um, this license to draft soldiers and Shallow was collecting people from his domain to, to draft. And the big, strong, hunky ones were buying themselves off. And Feeble, who's weak and thin, had this great line about, you know, 
you can only die once, and if you if you die this year, you're quit for the next. And the main thing is to do the service of the king. And so he he was this oxymoron, feeble, right? Um, virtue in a feeble body, unlike these able-bodied men who weren't virtuous and were buying themselves off. So that's so. Um, I bring that up because the whole, what he illustrates is the, the topic that the king was worried about before he was dying. Um, the force of necessity and how you face the force of necessity. How much we are victims or patients of necessity and how much we have free will and can control our destiny. So there's feeble with no physical strength to control his destiny, but exemplarily capable of controlling it in his character and his, by his free will. So the four dramatic triumphs were in four, Act 4, Scene 2, uh, Prince John defeated the rebels without any loss of blood. You remember that. He promised them to, to redress their grievances and they gave up their army and then he arrested them and executed them, but he went to redress their grievances. So there was equivocation, but it was justified, and it, it put an end to the war, the rebellion, without bloodshed. So that was one triumph. Then in Act 4, Scene 5, the prince goes into the king's bedroom where he thinks the king is dead, and he tries on the crown. Remember we read this last time? Last time was a long time ago. And, um, and he wrestles with the idea of being king. And, and what it means, and how it's killed his father. And he's going to uh, justify his earlier behavior by meriting this crown and passing it on to his own son. So he triumphs over the temptation of the idea of the crown of power. Um, and now we get the third triumph. So here's what happens. The king comes in and he says, at Act 5, Scene 2, line... Oh, let's say 40. No, 43, 44. This new and gorgeous garment majesty sits not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. Why? So the brothers are sad because their father just died. They're also afraid about what the new king, their brother, old eldest brother, is going to do. And he says, this is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amarath and Amarath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Amarath, a Turkish name, right? The Turks are the enemy, they're the infidels. Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. I'm going to be sad with you. I'm not happy to take on this role of majesty. Why then be sad? But entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. I'm in it the same as you, and you should not be any more sad than I am. You don't need to mix your sadness with fear. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Let me but bear your love, I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no other from your majesty, all the brothers say. You all look strangely on me, he says to the chief justice, and you most. Okay, he's looking at him like, oh, uh, what am I in for? You are, I think, assured I love you not? Chief Justice, I am assured if I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No, says the king. How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Rate, rebuke? and roughly sent to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? May this be washed in Lethe and forgotten? Lethe, the river of forgetfulness. Here's the Chief Justice's response. 
I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay then in me, and in the administration of his law, whilst I was busy for the commonwealth, your highness pleased to forget my place, the majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented, and struck me in my very seat of judgment. Now we can say the same thing now of somebody who mistreats a judge in a court. Who is that judge? He's not just a person. He is the representation of the will of the people of the United States of America, the sovereign of the nation. And to, to um, abuse him is to abuse the entire structure of the, of the nation and its polity. Here it's true of the king. So he says, if the deed were ill, line 83, be you contented, wearing now the garland, to have a son yet set your decrees at naught to pluck down justice from your awful bench, to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person, nay more, to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body. So if you want to justify what you did to me when I was justice and you abused me, then how would you feel if your son abused your image? Question your royal thoughts and make the case yours be now the father and propose a son. He goes on. And then he says, um, after this cold considerance, sentence me, line 98, and as you are a king, speak in your state what I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege's sovereignty. I was serving the king. I was doing justice. You were out of line. If you want to punish me for that, fine. But um, that would not be right. And the king says, You are right, justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still, still here means always, as usual, still bear the balance and the sword, that is, right, justice. And I do wish your honors may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did, so shall I live to speak my father's words. Now quoting his father, happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son, and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. Because he hit him, the, the prince hit the justice and the justice arrested him, <laughs> put him in jail. And the prince said, okay, I'll go to jail. You're right, I deserve it. He wants his own son to do the same. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear. With this remembrance, that you use the same with the like bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. There is my hand. You shall be as father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise directions. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave. Wild is the opposite of sober and serious, which is what Henry was all along. And the prince was wild, supposedly. My father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections. And with his spirit, sadly, I survive to mock the expectation of the world, just what he predicted he would do, to frustrate prophecies and to raise out rotten an opinion who hath writ me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath, prof hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now it doth turn and ebb back to the sea where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation. That war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us, in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand, that's the Chief Justice. Our coronation done, we will excite, as I before remembered, all our state, and God consigning to my good intents, 
No prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Boom. It's happened. Everything we've been waiting for is since the very end of Richard II, when the king said, what? Who can tell me about my unthrifty son? Now it's come to fruition. The brothers are amazed. The chief justice is floored. And uh, the kingdom is on a stable ground. All right. In Act 5, Scene 3, I'm not going to read the whole scene. It's more comedy stuff and pistol showing off and so on. But um, Pistol comes in and he says, I've got news. And he doesn't tell them what it is for a few minutes. <laughs> so Shallow says, um, if, sir, you come with news from the court, I take it there's but two ways, either to utter them or to conceal them. I am under the king, sir, in some authority. Pistol says, under which king, Bessonian, speak or die? It's, it's all bluster, right? He's a braggart soldier, but it's scary enough to Shallow. Shallow says, under King Harry. Pistol, Harry the fourth or fifth? Harry the fourth. Pistol, a footer for thine office. Sir John, thy tender lambkin now is king. Harry the fifth's the man, I speak the truth. When pistol lies, do this and fig me like the bragging Spaniard. Falstaff, what is the old king dead? As nail in door. Now, watch what Falstaff says. Away, Bardolph, saddle my horse. Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land, tis thine. Huh. Is Shallow qualified to choose what office he wants to? No. Pistol, I will double charge thee with dignities. Oh, joyful day, says Bardolph. I would not take a knighthood for my fortune. We're on the upward rise, right? Everything's in our commandment. Not even a knighthood would be as good. Um, I'm in Act 5, Scene 3, the very end of Act 5, Scene 3. Falstaff, carry Master Silence to bed. He's drunk. Master Shallow, my Lord Shallow, be what thou wilt. Master Shallow, my Lord Shallow, he's promoting him in words. Be what thou wilt, I am Fortune's steward. I control Fortune. Get on thy boots, we'll ride all night. Oh, sweet pistol, away, Bardolph. Come, pistol, utter more to me, and withal devise something to do thyself good. Boot, boot. So boot means booty. Um, and put on your boots and let's go. I know the young king is sick for me, says Falstaff. Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Blessed are they that have been my friends, and woe to my Lord Chief Justice. Now, to, the, to us, this is all ironical, right? We've seen the prince address, or the king, address the chief justice. We know this is a fantasy of Falstaff. He's riding for a fall. But he's willing to think of England as his possession. He can do what he wants. He can break the laws. He can steal horses. He can promote whoever he wants. This is why he's invested all this time and energy in the prince, for this purpose. But new laws are uh, operating. So in Act, four, Act 5, Scene 4, um, Hostess Quickly and Dal Tearsheet are arrested. They deserve to be. They've been running a body house. They've been stealing from people. There's all this nastiness going on. Um, and they're going to be examined. If they're guilty, they're going to be punished. And if they're not, they won't. But they're being arrested. So things are coming back around to justice. And then in Act 5, Scene 5, we get the final meeting of, of King Henry V and Falstaff. Um, line 5, Falstaff says, Act 5, Scene 5, Line 5. Stand here by me, Master Robert Shallow. I will make the king do you grace. 
I will leer upon him as it comes by and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. So he's, he's imagining that the king is going to be behaving like the prince. Um, he wishes we could have changed clothes, but it shows well that we came in our uh, mud bespattered clothing to meet him because it shows earnestness of affection. Um, Um, they, he's told that Dahl and, and uh, Mistress Quickly are in prison, and he says, I will deliver. So the king comes in with his entourage, and Falstaff is on the side in the crowd, and he shouts, God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. Now Hal is a nickname. It's what he's been called before he became king, Prince Hal. <coughs> but you don't call the king Hal. The heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. The king says, my lord chief justice, speak to that vain man. Chief justice, have you your wits? Know, what, know you what tis you speak? Falstaff ignores him. My king, my Jove, I speak to thee, my heart. And the king says, finally, now, I should just warn you that whole bunches of critics can't stand King Henry because he does this. How dare he? It's his friend. They've had so much fun together. We love Falstaff. How can he do this? He's such a cold-hearted bastard. No. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Now he's saying this in a way that everyone can hear him. Right? It's for Falstaff, but it's for everyone. Make less thy body, hence and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So I will those that kept me company when thou dost hear that I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and the feeder of my riots. Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten mile. Okay, he didn't banish him from England. He didn't kill him. He knows he's guilty of theft. The punishment of theft is hanging. He's not going to hang him. He's banishing him 10 miles from wherever the king is. So wherever the king goes, Falstaff's got to be 10 miles away. <clears throat> he's got to be 10 miles out of the center of London when the king's in the palace. If the king leaves London, he's got, he can't go near him. Okay. For competence of life, I will allow you that lack of means and force you not to evils. In other words, I'm going to give you a pension. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. You're not going to put shallow in charge of anything important, but if you repent and correct yourselves and become worthy, then I'll reward you with a reasonable position. Otherwise, no. Be it your charge, my lord, to see perform the tenor of our word, set on, and off he goes. And all Falstaff can say is, Master Shallow, I owe you a thousand pounds. He borrowed a thousand pounds for him to come to see the king. But he has no money. He spent it all. And Shallow says, well, how about half of it? Nope, I don't even have that. And then he convinces himself, oh, it's not real. He's going to call me in privately later. He has to sound like that in public. But that's fantasy. 
Lancaster, his brother, says, I like this fair proceeding of the kings. <clears throat> he hath intent his wonted followers shall, be, shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. Chief Justice, and so they are. So they've called Parliament. And the bet is that they're going to go to war in France. End of play with an epilogue that's kind of a teaser. teaser. Teaser for the next play. We're going to play with the daughter of the King of France. All right, end of Henry the Fourth, part two. Yes? Uh, well, when uh, the Chief Justice says, go carry to God, false out to the fleet, that's the fleet people. Yes. Because, no, he, he is. The ju Chief Justice is. Um, what line are you at? Uh, well, I don't have line numbers. Oh. Uh, line oh, yeah. Go carry, go carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. My lord, my lord, I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Okay, I'm going to listen to your case. So, it's, it's, um, he has plenty of reasons, as we've seen through the play, for arresting Falstaff. The only reason he couldn't do it before is the prince was standing up for him. So now he's going to arrest him and he's, he's going to deal with him according to the law. Probably not execute him because the prince, the king, wants him to be not killed but kept 10 miles away. But he's also going to make him pay back his debts and so on. <clears throat> and that kills Falstaff in a sense not by execution. All right, questions about that play we just finished. I'm now caught up with where I should be. Yes, questions? Yes. I have to confess I've never really understood the show that Powell has put on being a wastrel and so forth. I mean, his father, you know, there's a question as to his right to the throne, kind of shaky to begin with. And the father is going to die and, in fact, gets killed. And so he's the heir apparent of Second Richard II. Yeah, that was the point. And, but what, if I were Hal, I'd try to, you know, earn it from the beginning so that there wouldn't be this... Uh, potential you know, in, in Antony and Cleopatra, Charmian says to Cleopatra, don't upset Antony, just do what he says. And Cleopatra says, you idiot, that's the way to lose him. I have to contradict him. That's what keeps it exciting. So you're giving, you're giving him the exact opposite advice that he is <clears throat> engaging in in the whole series. And the reason is, once, once Richard II is dead, Henry IV is the uh, legitimate king because he was the next heir to the throne in the male line. Mortimer was through the female line. So there was kind of it's dubious, it's arguable anyway. But um, the, next, so the next younger cousin of the original seven brothers of the of sons of Edward III was John of Gaunt, and that was Henry's father. So if Richard had died without an heir, Henry would have become king. He was the next heir to the throne. So once Richard is dead, then there is a king, and uh, Prince Hal can come to the throne by right. But he's also got to have merit. In other words, he has to reunite what was split by Richard, right from merit. Now he's going to inherit it by right, and he's got to show merit. But he, his plot is that he's going to win England over by surprise. If he's, if he's a goody two-shoes all along, then the rebels are going to keep rising up because it's the Lancastrians and we don't like them. But if he's this mess, and then all of a sudden he makes friends among all the kind of low-life people, and then all of a sudden he shows himself like this, they're going, wow, that's what we need in a king. That's a good idea. <laughs> we can follow him. Now, he's going to do one other thing to cement his government, and that is unite all of England and go fight in France, which his father told him to do. Don't let local quarrels erupt. Bring them all together to have a common enemy. And how many leaders have followed that advice? If you 
if you're in trouble, you invent a war, and then everybody pulls together. That's exactly right. Now, I'm making this sound like a cynical thing, but uh, the beginning of this play, Henry V, goes to some lengths to establish that, in fact, uh, Henry V had the right to the throne of France, also by right, by inheritance. Um, later in history, that kind of disappears, but it's still a live issue in this period because Edward III was the son of the Queen of France, uh, Queen of France, I think. Uh, they're going to tell us here. And, um, and the French, uh, and they fought in France for those lands, and the French took them away, and so they're going to get them back. So it's not only good policy from a domestic point of view, it's actually legitimate from an international point of view. Other questions? Yes? Isn't a hell time to show that he's a man of the people and that you can trust his word? That you can trust his word, yes. Not that he's a man of the people. That he cares about the Yes, people. and that he's a just leader of the people. So as you said, that's sort of a play within a play. I mean, yeah. he was never this carouser. Correct. It was all an act. That's right. Because he saw what was happening to his father's realm. There was, there was uh, resistance and fighting everywhere. How am I going to unify everybody? I have to create a, a diversion and make them not take me seriously and then suddenly appear and be serious. You had a question. Oh, just uh, wondering if it was his plan all along to publicly denounce all sides. Yes. It had to be. I mean, it didn't necessarily have to be this way because he didn't necessarily know that Falstaff would run and shout out in the middle of his coronation march, you know, ridiculous things. Uh, how far will Falstaff go to show that, you know, he's, he's going to manipulate the king? Well, he went this far, so the king has to respond. But, but Falstaff really thought that he was a buddy of the king. But if you remember... The prince has spent his, all his time with Falstaff poking at him and telling him to shape up and stop behaving and don't misbehave and stop lying and stop thieving and all this. He was constantly warning him. So this isn't new. He, he might have expected it if he had taken him seriously. But Falstaff is a, you know, self-deluder. So, and it's drama, of course. It makes it very dramatic. Okay, act, I mean, Henry V, act one. So Henry V is a combination of two kinds of play. It's a, uh, sorry, I didn't warn you, I was walking. <laughs> uh, it's a pageant, a series of kind of set piece scenes, and also a drama, a dramatic um, evocation or demonstration of the triumphant progress of Henry V to the throne of France, uh, France and England, of course. So um, Shakespeare makes it uh, pageant-like partly by giving us prologues, poetic prologues in the form of a chorus to each act of the play. And the first one is about the theater itself. What am I trying to do writing a play for this little cockpit, this little wooden O that's the theater? So the prologue begins thus. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. Inventio, inventio means the coming up with things to say if you're going to give a speech. What should I say? How should I arrange it? That's part of the process of, of um, speaking, is coming up with what you're going to say. It's called invention. So he wants a muse of fire to ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. If I could do that, then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels 
leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the, un the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold, that's the wooden stage, uh, to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit? What's a cockpit? Down the street from the globe, there was bear baiting, and down the street from the bear baiting, there were, there were cockpits. What is that? You put two fighting cocks in a pit, and then you bet on them. Which one's going to kill the other first? That still goes on in El Cajon, in case you didn't know. I think it's not legal now, but uh, people do it anyway in the country. So that's what this cockpit is. He's been belittling this theater by calling it a cockpit. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks, that's helmets, that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, a zero, a crooked figure, in the right spot, turns a hundred thousand into a million. So it's powerful. And let us ciphers, meaning zeros, to this great account, this accounting, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck, our de deck means decorate, our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the wit supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. I just want you to look at that great line, printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. The Olivier film of this play is the great one, by the way. If you're going to watch the film, watch that one and skip the Brana. Um, he shows the horses riding over soft or moist grass-covered earth, and their hoofs go into the, to the ground. And you can see the hoof prints. So the line is printing their proud hoofs into the, in the receiving earth. Now, printing starts with a P, and proud starts with a P. And those are plosives. And the earth is soft. There's no plosive there. It's, so the, the horses are printing, boom, boom, their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, which get, takes the print. You get what I'm saying? The sound of the line and the meaning of the line are the same thing. And this is one of Shakespeare's absolutely greatest gifts. All great poets have this to an extent. All right, act one, scene one. Um, in every court, there are gossips and uh, talkers on the side. What's the king doing? What's he going to do next? What should we do? What do we want to do about that? How can we arrange this? How can we influence him? So the Bishop of Ely and the Archbishop of Canterbury are doing that. And they're talking about a bill that's going to go through Parliament that's going to cost them half of their entire uh, fortune, the whole Church of England. Which, of course, isn't the Church of England yet. It's the Catholic Church in England, of which the Archbishop of Canterbury is the head. So what are they going to do? Uh, well. We're going to offer the king a whole lot of money to go fight in France from the church so that he doesn't let this bill pass. It's worth it. But then Canterbury says at line 24, or he starts by saying, the king is full of grace and fair regard, Ely, and a true lover of the holy church. The courses of his youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left his father's body but that his wildness, mortified in him, seemed to die too. It's just what the king had said at the end of the previous play. 
And this, this play is being put on a few weeks later or a few months later, um, and he's reiterating the same idea. Yea, at that very moment, consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him, leaving his body as a paradise to envelop and contain celestial spirits. So everybody in this play, except the traitors, including them when they're being hypocrites, are exalting this king. And that all that together builds to create this impression in us. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such a heady currents, scouring faults. Uh, he goes on. We are blessed in the change. And he develops it more here, but reason and divinity. So I'm not going to read it all. Um, <clears throat> he can cut the Gordian knot of policy. Uh, every practice in art is mistress to this theoric, that is, his theory governs perfectly every practical uh, action. Since his addiction was to course his vein, his company's unlettered, rude, and shallow, his hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports, and never noted in him any study, any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts and popularity. This is a wonder. He says, which is a wonder how his grace should glean it. We, we didn't see him studying. We didn't see him thinking. We didn't see him learning. We just saw him wasting his life away. So it seemed. But he was thinking and learning and studying. Okay, so miracles are over. It's got to be... Um, by, by a real development. He must... He must have intentionally obscured his contemplation. He's leaning toward our part in not passing this bill. Um, and I was about to get him to commit to that when the French ambassador arrived and we had to postpone. So now the next scene is going to be with the French ambassador, but not before Canterbury gets to um, justify this war in France. Now, the Olivier film makes fun of the Archbishop of Canterbury going on and on and on and on. But Shakespeare's audience was probably a lot more interested in what he was saying than we are. To us, all the names just blur together. So I'm going to read a little bit of this so you get a sense of how um, significant it is, despite <clears throat> the comedy that can be made of it. Um, the Can Canterbury comes in and praises the king, and the king says, surely, thank you. I'm at line eight, is it? Seven, eight, nine. My learned lord, says the king, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law salic that they have in France, or should or should not bar us in our claim, that is, to the throne of France. And God forbid, my dear and faithful Lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreate, whose right suits not in native colors with the truth. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, whose guiltless drops are every one a woe, a sore complaint against him whose wrongs gives edge unto the swords that make such waste in brief mortality. Under this conjuration speak, my lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart that what you speak is in your conscience washed as pure as sin with baptism. Okay, that's a pretty intense case to make. He's not saying, you know, tell me what I want to hear here. He's saying, I trust you. You've done the study. I'm willing to go to war on your say-so, but you better be sure that it's true what you're saying and not just, you know, politics. So 
So Canterbury says, there is no bar to make against your highness claim to France, but this which they produce from Pharamond. There is no obstacle. You own the kingdom of France. The only argument they are making, the French, is that Pharamond said in years gone by, in terram salicam mulieris ne succedant, in the in Salic lands, women can't succeed. So you can't inherit the throne through a woman. Which Salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France, and Pharamond the founder of this law and female bar. Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sala and of Elbe. And then he goes on, where Charles the Great, blah, blah, blah. And then he says at line uh, 50 or so, 52, then doth it well appear the Salic law was not devised for the realm of France. So they're wrong to say, because women don't succeed in France because of the Salic law, you can't be the king of France. Nor did the French possess the Salic land until 401 and 20 years after the function of King Fairman. He goes on. Besides, he says, at line 64, 65. Besides, their writers say, King Pepin, which deposed Childeric, and then he goes on to say, three of their own kings claim descent through the female line. So they're lying when they say you can't inherit in Salic land, which is France. Number one, Salic land isn't France. And number two, you yourselves claim three of your major kings to, to descend from women. So then he concludes at line 86. So that as clear as is the summer sun, King Pepin's title and Hugh Capet's claim, King Louis, his satisfaction, that's Louis the um, uh, tenth. Uh, all appear to hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France unto this day. The king at the moment is Charles VI. Howbeit they would hold up this Salic law to bar your highness claiming from the female, and rather choose to hide them in a net than amply to embar their crooked titles usurped from you and your progenitors. And that's probably true as Shakespeare sees the history. Edward III was the um, ruler, just ruler of those lands in France. And the wars uh, with France broke it up. And then the Wars of the Roses in England broke up uh, England, at least took its attention away from France. But now he's going back to Edward III, and you are the rightful heir to France. So the king makes it very pointed. May I with right and conscience make this claim. I'm not doing it unless I can do it with a clear conscience. And Canterbury says, the sin upon my head, dread sovereign, for in the book of Numbers it is, is it writ, and then he talks about that scene in the, um, in the book of Leviticus, no, Genesis, Numbers, the book of Numbers, we just finished it last week, um, in which the daughters of one man who died in the wilderness um, not because of punishment, came to Moses and said, you know, you're only giving lands to the men, but our father had a share of land, and he's got only daughters. Can't we inherit? And Moses checks with God, and God says, yeah, they should inherit. So they do. And then he goes on and explains a little more about it. And then the king says, okay, I believe you. That's good. But what about Scotland? If we go to France... Uh, the Scots are going to start in, in doing incursions into England. And finally, somebody, who is it? Um, Canterbury. He's a smart man, Canterbury. He says at line two, six, 215, divide your happy England into four, whereof take you one quarter into France, and, with, and you withal shall make all Gallia shake. A quarter of your armies can go conquer France, and three quarters at home will be just fine to protect us from the Scots. So the king says, all right, call in the messengers. Now, I, now that I know my situation, 
I'm willing to hear what the Dauphin, the, the uh, heir apparent to the French king, has to say. Uh, before I start this, to, does anybody want a break? Need a break? Crave, claim? No? Yes? Yes? Um, I, some of you didn't hear, but you're to take one of those chocolates and eat it. It was given as a gift to me from an old college friend who heard my podcasts and thought they were so great that she couldn't not send me a present. <laughs> the real present was the letter she wrote, which was just something you live a long time for. So, all right, I'll take a break, eat, eat a chocolate. So, the king says, call in the messenger sent from the Dauphin. We are, now we are well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our awe, or break it all to pieces. Or there we'll sit, ruling in large and ample empery, or France and all her almost kingly dukedoms, or lay these bones in an unworthy urn, tombless, with no remembrance over them. Either our history shall with full mouth speak freely of our acts, or else our grave, like Turkish mute, shall have a tongueless mouth, not worshipped with a waxen epitaph. <clears throat> and we're going to conquer France, or I'm going to die trying. And of course, the audience knows that he won this war. So it's kind of exciting to see him go for it. And of the ambassadors of France. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin? Not literally, well, actually distant cousin in some long ago derivation, but um, cousin because they're, they're both royal. For we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. Ambassador, may it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you far off the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? Can we speak freely here, or do we need to be afraid of what you might do? King, we are no tyrant, but a Christian king, unto whose grace our passion is as subject as is our wretches fettered in our prisons. Our grace controls our passion. This is Plato's image, right, of the soul controlling the body and the passions of the heart. It's the opposite of Falstaff, who is controlled by his passions, <clears throat> by his desires, really, and opposite of Hotspur, who was controlled by his passions. But we're not like that. We, the royal plural. Why is there a royal plural? Do you remember? Yeah, the two bodies of the king, the individual person and the embodiment of the state. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus then in few, says the ambassador, your highness lately sending unto France did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the prince, our master, the Dauphin, says that you savor too much of your youth and bids you be advised. Okay, you are, you are a wastrel and you're still a wastrel. There's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one, that is, a light-hearted dance. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you meter for your spirit, more appropriate for your spirit, this ton, this chest of treasure, and in lieu of this desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. Thus the dolphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Exeter opens them. The chest. Tennis balls, my liege. Why? Yeah. You want to play games? Go play tennis. Leave us alone. King jumped up into a rage and goes slashing at the ambassador. No. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. 
When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler match as this is all imagery of tennis matches. He has made a mass, match with such a wrangler that all the courts, meaning tennis courts of France, will be disturbed with chases. So tennis courts uh, punning on the ducal courts and the king's court. And we understand him well how he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. We never value this poor seat of England, and therefore living hence, did give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are merriest when they are from home. But tell the Dauphin, I will keep my state, that is my condition as king, and my throne, and my position as king, be like a king, and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that I have laid by, sorry, for that I have laid by my majesty and plotted like a man for working days, but I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the dauphin blind to look on us. And tell the pleasant prince this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones. He doesn't mean testicles, he means tennis balls. It's funnier. It's, it's funnier, but it's not what it means, so don't, don't, get, don't go for the cheap laugh. Hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. Cannonballs, that means. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the dauphin's scorn. Rhymed couplet, meaning we're getting to the end of the speech and hitting it. Then he stops himself. But all this, but this lies all within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you the dauphin, I am coming on to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace, and tell the dauphin his jest will savor but of shallow wit, and thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct. Fare you well. All right, so we got the mock. So now we see that he's not a lunatical tyrant. <clears throat> he can take a joke, but he's going to make them, make them pay for it. This was a merry, uh, the, uh, the ambassador goes out. This was a merry message, says Exeter. King, we hope to make the sender blush at it. <clears throat> That's in two senses, probably. Be embarrassed and possibly bleed. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. For we have now no thought in us but France. <clears throat> so off they go. End of Act One. Questions? Yes? So Henry V is what, maybe 25 or so? 25 years, mid 20s? Yeah. And how about the king and the son? The Dauphin is about uh, Henry's age, give or take, and the king is older. The king is of Henry's generation. Um, yeah, approximately. <clears throat> I can look up the details after if you want me to. I've got, no, I've got all the notes here. <laughs> It'll take me a while to find it. All right. Um, I wanted to say that this play is filled with the prince's references to God. And they're all genuine. There's no cynicism here. As there was, for example, with Richard III. And there was, there's no pretentiousness as there was with Richard II. God is sending his spiders to kill my enemies just because I'm the king. 
And that's not going on here. He is constantly aware of God. He's constantly grateful and thankful <clears throat> before the battles, after the battles, um, as we saw challenging Canterbury to be honest with their motives and so on. So that Shakespeare is creating the impression not only of a beloved king, but of a um, virtuous and holy, or at least pious king. And he's, he, he's just what you want. If you're going to have a king, you want this guy to be your king. All right, act two, chorus. Now all the youth of England are on fire and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. They put away their silken uh, fun clothes and they're all getting dressed in armor. But the French have suborned three English lords to try to kill Henry. And the chorus warns us this. Confirmed conspiracy, line 27, with fearful France, and by their hands this grace of kings must die if hell and treason hold their promises ere he take ship for France and in Southampton. They're going to kill him in Southampton before he gets on board the ship to go across to France. So we're going to take you to France pretty soon, but first we have to stop in Southampton and see what happens with these traitors. And then we have Nim and Bardolph. Nim, Bardolph, uh, Pistol. So there's a, there's a war going on between Pistol and Nim. And Bardolph is trying to make peace between them. And all of this is a... Um, is, uh, what should we say? Corruption in little at the level of these lowlifes that Prince Hal was hanging out with that reflects the corruption in big of the traitors to the king. But we find out um, that Falstaff is very sick and would to bed. And the boy makes some jokes, put thy face between the sheets and do the office of a warming pan. Because Bardolph's nose is bright red and bumpy with alcohol, uh, a life of alcohol. So Bardolph makes them, tries to make them friends by threatening to kill them if they don't. And so they agree. Uh, uh, Pistol has married the woman, Mistress Quickly, that Nim thought he liked. So there's jealousy there. And there's also some borrowed money that didn't get paid back. So that's what they're fighting over. But they're sounding big. Like they're, they're all sounding like they're going to kill each other. But it turns out they're all cowards. They don't fight or kill anybody or do anything to endanger themselves. And we're going to see them that way even in the war in France. Just sounding big but not doing anything useful. Uh, I'm only skipping reading it all because I'll never finish if I read it all. Okay, so the king knows about the traitors. Bedford and Exeter and Westmoreland are in on it. Not in on it against the king, but they've discovered this treachery. And so the king calls them in, the three of them, and says, we're all going to France and um, do you think we have enough power to win in France? Oh, yes, a scroop. I doubt that not, says the king, since we are well persuaded he's being ironical. And we carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in a fair consent with ours, nor leave not one behind that doth not wish success and conquest to attend on us. Everybody's on my side. The one's going with me to fight, and the one's staying home to take care of England. Everybody is on my side. And Cambridge says, never was monarch better feared and loved than is your majesty. And Gray says, true. Um, 
And we're, therefore the king says we have cause of thankfulness. And then the king says, uh, Scroop, the nearest friend of these traders, says, so service shall with steel and sinews toil and labor shall refresh itself with hope to do your grace incessant services. Everybody's on your side. King says, we judge no less. Yeah, we know. Then he says, uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man, free the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on, and on his more advice we pardon him. He was slandering the king. That's punishing the offense. He was arrested, and then he got sobered up, and now we realize he was just the wine talking, let's let him go. We pardon him. Scroop says, that's mercy but too much security. Security in Shakespeare doesn't mean what we mean by it. It means imagining that you are secure when you're not. If you have security, it means not that you're secure, but that you think you're secure, but you're not. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. If you bear with him, other people are going to behave like that. Oh, yet, oh, let us yet be merciful, says the king. So may your highness and pun yet punish too. Gray, sir, you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. You don't have to let him go out of prison, just not killing him is mercy. Alas, says the king, your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. The poor guy, you're all against him, you three. If little faults proceeding on distemper, meaning drunkenness, shall not be winked at, how shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes, chewed, swallowed, and digested, appear before us? We'll yet enlarge the man, though Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our person, would have him punished. And now to our French causes. Who are the late commissioners? Cambridge, I'm a commissioner, Scroop, I'm a commissioner, Gray, I'm a commissioner. Okay, here are your commissions. He gives them their papers. Read them. And know, I know your worthiness. The, the papers he gives them are their indictments. My Lord of Westmoreland and Uncle Exeter, we will aboard tonight. Then he turns back. Why, how now, gentlemen? What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? Blood is drained from their faces. Look ye how they change, their cheeks are paper. Why, what read you there that hath so cowarded and chased your blood out of appearance? Boom, they confess. He's on to them. I do confess my fault and do submit me to your highness mercy. Gray and Scroop, to which we all appeal. King. The mercy that was quick in us but late, by your own counsel, is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy, for your own reasons turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. My lord of Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord, <clears throat> to furnish him with all appurtenance belonging to his honor. And this man hath for a few light crowns money, lightly conspired and sworn unto the practices of France to kill us here at Hampton, to the which this knight, no less for bounty bound to us than Cambridge is, than Cambridge is, hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop, thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature, that thou didst bear the key of all my counsels? Sorry, thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels, that knewest the very bottom of my soul, that almost mightst have coined me into gold, which thou have practiced on me for thy use? May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger? Tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Treason and murder ever kept together 
as two yoke devils sworn to either's purpose, working so grossly in the natural cause that admiration did not whoop at them. But thou, gainst all proportion, didst bring in wonder to wait on treason and on murder. Okay, treason and murder go together, but in you, it's not just, you know, the surprise of treason and murder, it's amazement because of what you were before. And whatsoever cunning fiend it was that wrought upon thee so preposterously hath got the voice in hell for excellence. It wins the prize in hell for excellence in, in demonism. All other devils that suggest, meaning tempt by treasons, do botch and bungle up damnation with patches, colors, and with forms being fetched from glistering semblances of piety. But he that tempered thee, bade thee stand up, gave no instance why thou shouldst do treason, unless to dub thee with the name of traitor. If that same demon that had gulled thee thus <clears throat> should with his lion gate walk the whole world, he might return to vasty Tartar back and tell the legions, I can never win a soul so easy as that Englishman's. Oh, how hast thou with jealousy infected the sweetness of affiance? Jealousy means suspicion. Show men dutiful? Why so didst thou? Seem they grave and learned? Why so didst thou? Came, come they of noble family? Why so didst thou? Seem they religious? Why so didst thou? Or are they spare in diet, free from gross passion, or of mirth, or anger, constant in spirit, etc., etc.? Such and so finely bolted didst thou seem, and thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full fraught man, and best endued with some suspicion. I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine methinks is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law, and God acquit them of their practices, meaning may God forgive them. Exeter, I rest thee of high treason, all three of them. Our purposes, says Scroop, God, God justly hath discovered. I repent my faults. Uh, Cambridge, the gold did not seduce, though I admit it as a motive, the sooner to effect what I intended, but God be thanked for prevention. I'm glad. We didn't get away with it. Gray, never did faithful subject more rejoice. I'm glad we were discovered. <laughs> King, God quit you in his mercy. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. We've seen that, right? In the absence of a king, in the absence of a strong king, a loved king, an obeyed king, England falls apart. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. Okay? I'm not holding it against you personally. I'm, I'm alive, you're going to be dead. But we, our kingdom safety, must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. Notice, he's not just saying off with their head. He knows what the law is, but he's delivering them to justice. Get you therefore hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof God of his mercy give your you patience to endure, and true repentance of all your dear offenses. Bear them hence, and off they go. Now, lords for France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as us like glorious. That is, it's going to make your names as well as mine. We doubt not of a fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. We doubt not now, but every rub is smoothed on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Cheerly to the sea, the signs of war advance. No king of England, if not king of France. Nice rhyme.
Act two, scene three. Now we're going to have the death of Falstaff. Boo hoo. Great loss to the world. Queen Elizabeth couldn't stand it. She had Shakespeare write another comedy in which Falstaff would be shown in love. And he wrote uh, Mary Wives of Windsor in response to her request. That's the story. And there's no reason to disbelieve it. It's, there's some evidence for it. So we're earning, E-A-R-N, it means grieving, sorrowing. For Falstaff he is dead, line five. Bardolph, would I were with him where so e'er he is. Would I were with him where so e'er he is, either in heaven or in hell. Hostess, nay, sure he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. She's making a malapropism, a, fall, a mistake. She means Abraham's bosom. I made a finer end and went away, and it had been any Christum child. He died like any good, well-brought-up Christian child. A parted even just between twelve and one, even at the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers end, I knew there was but one way. He wasn't going to recover. For his nose was as sharp as a pen and a babbled of green fields. The folio, which is the only early text, says um, a table of green fields. And Tybalt, I think it was, he mended it to babbled because of the handwriting, the actual um, way that the letters of table and the letters of Babel are formed. So probably babbled is right. But what's he doing babbling of green fields? She doesn't know what he's doing, but we do. And namely, he's reciting Psalm 23. Thou leadest me by the still waters and the green pastures and so on set at the table before me, before my enemies. How now, Sir John, quoth I, what man? Be a good cheer, cheer up. <laughs> He's dying, she says, cheer up. So I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Now I, to comfort him, bid him I should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. Now, when should he trouble himself with thinking of God? He's dying. It's just the moment he should be thinking of God. And because she reports this, we can accept that he has died in some degree penitent. He's called out on God for salvation and quoted the psalm. And she doesn't know what all that means, but we do, and he did. And so we can feel like Falstaff died at least somewhat repentant. So he's not going to hell, as she says. I hope there, uh, so, so I bade me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were cold as any stone, his feet. Then I fell to his knees, and so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. Then they say he cried out of sack meaning he cried out attacking alcohol. Aye, yeah, that he did, said the hostess. Bardolph, and of women, he cried out complaining of women. Hostess, nay, that it did not. But the boy was there, yes, that it did, and said they were devils incarnate. Hostess, I could never abide carnation, t'was a color he never liked. <clears throat> Boy, I once, I said once the devil would have him about women. Hostess, I did in some sort indeed handle women, but then he was rheumatic and talked of the whore of Babylon. Do you not remember I saw a flea stick upon Bardolph's nose and I said it was a black soul burning in hell? Bardolph, well, the fuel is gone that maintained that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Didn't make money from him, it just got drink, which turned my nose red, and that's the fire. So Nim says, let's go. The king's going to be leaving from Southampton, and they go off to war. 
Now, they're going off to war, not to fight the French. They don't care. They're going off to steal things. All right, Act 2, Scene 4, we're in the French court. What is the French court like? Puffed up with themselves. Underestimating the king of England. Underestimating the English followers of that king. Bragging about their own power and their own abilities. So the king says, the English are coming with full power. We need to defend ourselves. And the Dauphin, his son, line 14, says, my most redoubted father. You see where I am, Act 2, Scene 4, line 14. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we, war we arm us against the foe. For pe meet means appropriate, necessary. For peace itself should not so dull a kingdom, though war nor known nor no known quarrel were in question, but the defenses, musters, preparations should be maintained, assembled, and collected, as were a war in expectation. It's not good for a kingdom to be so calm and satisfied that it doesn't prepare for war just in case. Therefore, I say, tis meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France, and let us do it with no show of fear. No with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Wits and Morris dance. There they've got King Henry dancing again, like he was pretending to do as a kid. For my good liege, she, meaning England, is so idly kinged, her scepter so fantastically borne, by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth, that fear attends her not. So just the thing he said we should do, prepare just in case, even though there's no sign of war. He's going against it now, saying we don't have to be afraid. It's, they're so weak. He's such a loser. It doesn't matter. Constable has seen him. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. And of course, we know he's right, because we've seen the king. He's not giddy, shallow, vain, humorous. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question your grace the late ambassadors with what great state he heard their embassy, how well supplied with noble counselors, how modest in exception, and withal, how terrible in constant resolution. That is, I've heard the report of the ambassador that came back and told me what we saw in that earlier scene with the ambassador. He did not behave like a giddy youth. And you shall find his vanities forspent, were but the outside of the Roman Brutus covering discretion with a coat of folly. As gardeners do with order, hide those roots that shall first spring and be most delicate. It was only a, a, a show, this giddiness of the king. And of course, we know he's right. Well, tis not so, my lord high constable. But though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defense, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. Yet later, they're betting on how many English they're going to kill. Who's going to kill more? But the king says, think we, Harry, strong, and princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. <clears throat> and then he, he describes the forebears of this king, how powerful they were. Edward the Black Prince, Edward III, his son Edward the Black Prince. They trounced us soundly in their day. And he is a descendant of that house. And we know it's true, because he's the son of Henry IV, who was Bolingbroke and a warrior. And he was the son of John of Gaunt, who was the great warrior son of Edward uh, III. So yeah, the king is right. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. Then the ambassadors from England come. The Dauphin's not convinced, coward dogs, he calls them. So the king says, what from our brother England? Now this is Exeter, 
speaking. Exeter is a duke and the uncle of the king. From our brother of England, says the king of France. From him, says Exeter, and thus he greets your majesty. He wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed, borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, belongs to him and to his heirs, namely the crown and all wide-stretched honors that pertain by custom and the ordinance of times unto the crown of France. That you may know tis no sinister nor awkward claim picked from the wormholes of long vanished days, nor from the dust of old oblivion raked, he sends you this most memorable line. He gives him a paper. In every branch truly demonstrative, willing you overlook this pedigree, and when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Uh, Dakin Matthews points out that the difference between the meanings of challenger and champion have reversed since Shakespeare's time. The challenger was the person, not who'd won against everybody, but who was in place, in position. And champions went against him. So he gives a general challenge, and individual champions come against him. Uh, and whoever wins then becomes not the champion. He's been a champion. Now he becomes the challenger. So he's the true challenger. I am the rightful king. You are uh, wrongly holding the throne in my place. King, or else what follows? Bloody, con <coughs> sorry, bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming in thunder in, and in earthquake like a Jove, that if requiring fail he will compel, and bids you in the bowels of the Lord deliver up the crown and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. In Branagh's film, which is all blood and mud and false attributions of speeches, um, the characterization of the king is of a dark, a man with a dark side, bloody, realpolitik, Machiavellian, in addition to being heroic and popular and all the other stuff we're seeing. And it's a lie, it's false. They use as evidence a speech like this, and later the speech before Harfleur, where the king says, here are all the horrible things that are going to happen to you if you don't surrender the town. But the point of all that horrible speech is, A, those are the things that do happen in war when the soldiers are disobeying their leader. And B, I'm giving you an opportunity to prevent that by surrendering the town. So. He's not bloodthirsty. He's using images of bloodthirstiness to get them to avoid bloodshed. That's the whole point of it. And that's the context. And that's the outcome. I mean, it's the outcome at Harfleur. It's not the outcome here. But he's terrifying them about war on purpose because he's giving them a choice to avoid it. And on your head, turning the widow's tears and or the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the private maiden's groans, for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting too. That's the message from king to king. If the dauphin's here, I got another message for him. King says, all right, we'll consider it. Dauphin, for the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Meaning the king of England. Exeter. Scorn and defiance. Slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Thus says my king, 
and if your father's highness do not, in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, uh, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second accent of, this, of his ordinance. In other words, all the caverns will, in France will echo the sound of the thunder of his cannons to re-echo the mock. I desire nothing but odds with England, says the Dauphin. To that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris balls. That is, Paris made tennis balls. Exeter, he'll make your Paris louver shake for it. Louver is the palace where they are. We're at the mistress court of mighty Europe. And be assured you'll find a difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found, between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he weighs time even to the utmost grain. That you shall read in your own losses if he stay in France. King says, I'll tell you tomorrow what our decision is. End of Act Two. Okay, questions. Questions, comments, arguments. Yes? Why did King of France send the Dauphin to deal with Henry? Because the Dauphin is, you know, just kind of hothead. And a and a uh, ego. Yeah. Because he's weak. He doesn't he doesn't know any better. He's he's and he's not taking That's why he needs a knight to think about it, for heaven's sake. Yeah, he needs a night to think about it. But, you know, it's a scary proposition what Henry is sending him through Exeter. It's scary. And um, he has to consider, am I the rightful king of, of France, given this paperwork, which, is, which we heard the details of in some large part from Canterbury. Um, and the English audience, of course, is convinced that it's all legit. So... But it's also a sign of his weakness. And if he's got the Dauphin as his heir and the Dauphin as his chief advisor, he's not in a great position. It's, it's, and he also uh, didn't take Henry seriously. You no, know, he didn't take him seriously at all. So I mean, he is, he is disposed to take him a little more seriously than the Dauphin. But, um, you know, the Dauphin's young and vigorous and the king is old and dependent, really. So he's used to making these decisions, but he doesn't know what to say, so he's going to think about it. And he's going to listen to all the, the lords and his son. But basically, the, the court of France is depicted as being both arrogant and weak. That is, it's puffed up but empty. And that's partly why the smaller English force can defeat them at Agincourt. Of course, the main reason is God's will, as we'll find out. Yes, there was also technology. Uh, the English longbowmen were superb, um, and the French were over armored and heavy. Right? Is that what you were thinking of? Yeah. So, there was a lot involved in the actual historical, but in the play, it's, it's providence uh, favoring the, the, the true and the strong and the virtuous as against the weak and the arrogant and, and the, the prideful, I would say. Wouldn't you think too it's also written from the English history? Absolutely. And Yes. Yes. You would think, but remember that Queen Elizabeth has an elaborate uh, spy network going on. She's persecuting people of the wrong religion. She's um, she's a tyrant. In addition to all the great things we know about her, um, 
and sh and some of Shakespeare's friends were threatened by her at various times. So one of the things he's doing is saying, this is what a king should be like. Right? This is an ideal king. This is a virtuous king. I'm not saying anything about our queen. I'm talking about Henry V long ago. But here's how, here's what we love in a king. Now the queen, Elizabeth, flattered herself for being sensitive to the people and for, for being forgiving, like uh, people de did plays. Um, and if they were not as good as she hoped they would be, as long as they meant well, she flattered herself for being indulgent. And, and uh, Shakespeare uses those images in Midsummer Night's Dream by like Theseus uh, and others. And um, in fact, um, I think I told you last time, but you weren't here, that, that the um, Earl of Essex, who was setting a rebellion going against Queen Elizabeth, um, hired Shakespeare's company to perform Richard II the day before they were going to move on London and overthrow the queen. And he thought that would rouse up the people to overthrow Elizabeth the way in the play they overthrow uh, Richard. And they put on the play. They got paid extra for it. They put on the play. And the, um, the rebellion came to nothing. They got arrested and eventually executed. But Shakespeare's company was called in by its representatives, <clears throat> in the person of its representatives, and asked, what do you think you're doing performing this play before this rebellion? And they go, we don't know. We didn't know. He just paid us to put on the play. They paid us 40 extra shillings. We, uh, we didn't know. So it was very Shakespearean. It was a play within a play. Yeah. And, and Elizabeth is supposed to have said in response to this, I am Richard. Know you not that? So the king is the king, and you've got to be careful what you do in a play. So, but what I'm saying is that this idealized king, it's not just how great we English are compared to you dumb French. It's also, look at all these horrible English kings we've had. I mean, some horrible and some not so horrible, but, you know, a hundred years of civil war and corruption and self-aggrandizement, which is only going to end with Richard III. Um, and, and being killed by Henry VII and setting up Elizabeth's Tudor line. So there the mythology of the Tudors is preserved, making Henry VII the, the redeemer. But um, in the meantime, you know, England has been a mess before Henry and it will be a worse mess after him. So Shakespeare, out of that mess, is pulling this man. And there were reasons to, to uh, make Henry the ideal, too, in order to illustrate for his audience the opposite of all that's wrong with the bad guys that he's been and will be writing about. The Henry VI and the Richard III's and the Richard II. Um, and later, he, you know, he's going to have these misguided people, uh, King Lear and Macbeth and Coriolanus and, <clears throat> and Brutus and Julius Caesar. So now everybody knows who's written anything that it's harder to make a good character believable than a bad one. And that's because the bad one is in us all. We all have that element. We all have that capacity for jealousy and envy and greed and pride and all the other uh, things that can go wrong. And we also have maybe some virtue in us, but to make a good character come alive and seem real and lovable and believable and be good brings out all the cynics. Oh, nobody's ever like that. Nobody's really like that. Everybody's more like me. And so they, it, it's, a, it's a big hurdle to overcome in an audience to convince somebody of someone good. But Shakespeare's achieved it in this, and it's because of everything everybody says about him and everything he does and says about himself. And it's all in the context 
of a, a worldview that makes his virtue shine, that makes his virtue matter. All the things he chooses to do make a difference. Um, and so we, we, and then we can use him to compare everyone else to, including his father. Good king as though uh, Henry IV was. Henry V is brilliant. And of course, what's the tragedy? He dies young. He dies and his son is nine months old, Henry VI. And so he's governed by uncles. And he's got uncles on all sides, right? French, English. Uh, and so it's a mess. And Shakespeare's already written about that whole mess in the Henry VI plays. So, okay. Uh, chorus to Act 3, Scene 1. Or chorus before Act 3. Or that is Act... Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. Chorus. To Act 3. That's what I meant. I, I won't read the whole thing, but thus with imagined wing our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than, of, than that of thought. So you suppose you've seen the king embark, his fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus fanning, Ply, play with your fancies, and in them behold upon the hemp and tackle ship boys climbing. I mean, this is so good, you can just see it. All right, I'm going to read it more carefully, and you'll see it in your mind's eye. Play with your fancies, and in them behold upon the hemp and tackle ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle, which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threadened sails, borne with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottoms, that means ships, through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage, and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing, that is a whole city of ships. For so appears this fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow, follow. Grapple your minds to sternage of this navy, and leave your England as dead midnight still, guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women, either past or not arrived to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow these culled and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? Work, work your thoughts, and therein see a siege Behold, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Behold the ordnance on their carriages with fatal mouth gaping on girdled harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not. And the nimble gunner with Linstock now the devilish cannon touches. Alarm and chambers go off. Oh, go away, go away. And down goes all before them. Still be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. Or close the wall up with our English dead. The breach is a break in the wall. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock, or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath, and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noble English, whose blood is fed from fathers a war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed, sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you call fathers did beget you. 
Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George. Boom, he runs into the breach ahead of them. <laughs> and they follow, except for Nim and Bardolf and Pistol. They're hanging back, as we'll see. So there's a great speech. It's a, it's a great actor's um, set piece because it builds, 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 builds. You have to figure out as an actor how to build all the way through to that final cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George. And you got to hear Olivier do it. It's superb. Um, so there's a breach in the wall, and they they're continue fighting. Um, and then there are arguments about what they're doing. And finally, the, the uh, mayor, what is he? The, the, um, the governor of the town comes out on the wall, and, uh, and the king gives him a choice. You either surrender the town, or this is what will happen. I'll read that next time. And uh, he, he surrenders the town. He's moved by the speech enough to know which side of the bread his, which side the bread is buttered on. So, but we'll do that next uh, Thursday. And God willing, there's a lot to do, but finish the play. Um, by nine o'clock on Thursday. Hope to see you all in two days. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you for coming back after all this hiatus. I've been missing you. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so you wouldn't have to read it. <laughs> I just remind you that um, I spent part of the year doing podcasts. And so um, there are two series of podcasts. One series is all kind of introductory stuff, background, um, and the other is all about particular plays, and then three on the sonnets. I think there are about 60 altogether. Uh, so I kept myself busy, but um, uh, if you miss something, the the video will be put up as soon as I get it and on YouTube. And the, but also I've covered this play to some extent. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not doing as thorough a job in the podcast because they have to be shorter, but um, the basic ideas are there. So you can check those out if you're interested. And by all means, share them if you like them. Because not that I want more chocolate, <laughs> but uh, it would be nice to have a broad enough audience to convince a publisher to publish the damn book. So that's my motive. Well, well take it from me. I haven't listened to all of them, but the ones I've listened to, they really, really are good. Good. Thank you. I'm glad. Thank you. Definitely worth So we just search YouTube for... Uh, it's called Appreciating Shakespeare with Dr. Rapp. Okay. But if you email me, you have my email. When I email you back, it'll be, I link it at the bottom, so you can just click on that. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you for coming.